The title, uh, Breaking Bad, what, what exactly does that mean? I, I'm not cool enough to understand. No, that, so. you know what? You're, you're, you're very cool. It's just uh, no one's ever heard of it before. I, <laughs> I, I come from Virginia, and uh, it's a very much a southern regionalism mm. that I thought everybody knew. <laughs> it means to raise hell. Oh, okay. So he's like, I was out the other night at the bar, and I just tied one on, and I really broke bad. I just gotcha. really, oh, man, I just wound up in the back of a squad car. and. <laughs> and, uh, so it's a regionalism, but I and I named it Breaking Bad, and the script when it went out, either people are too polite to question it or something. <laughs> I remember the head of uh, Sony said, "Can't you think of a better title?" And I said, "Well, I kind of like this one." He says, "I don't know what the hell it means." You know? mm. But uh, I thought everybody, I didn't realize it was a, uh, it was as regional an expression as uh, as it is. Mm -hmm. but, uh, Okay, got it. Yeah. <laughs> I'll try not to do it though. <laughs> yeah, don't break bad. Don't break bad. You break a little bad. Don't break <laughs> a lot Walter of bad. white size bad. Yeah. yeah. Yes. 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 I was also uh, maybe you can give us an example of any kind of theme or tone that you didn't anticipate would be important that's kind of bubbled up. I guess family. I, I didn't know the show would be as much about family as it's turned out to be. Hmm. Family, you know. Yeah. Oh, steal from the best. I mean, we, we think more and more as a, we, my writers and I think more and more about The Godfather and The Godfather Part Two. Mm. We quote it all the time in the room. This was never intended to be a uh, any kind of a, an homage or a continuation or a southwestern version of, of The Godfather, but we find ourselves more and more inspired by it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that movie, certainly those two movies, all three, I guess, uh, uh, really speak to... Uh, Family. It's very much a theme of family and the idea of a man in the midst of uh, providing for his family, doing right for his family, utterly destroys it. Right. So those parallels were never intentional from day one, but they are definitely there. And we, we think about them more and more as, yeah. as the show progresses. I'm, I'm also curious about Heisenberg. Um, you know, when I heard that, of course, I, I, I loved it immediately because yeah. it's, you know, name of a Nobel laureate who uh, founded... Uh, the uncertainty principle, but I was wondering if there was any other symbolism, or was it was I looking into it? Was Einstein taken? What, you know, well, why, Heisenberg, why we we were naming it after Werner Heisenberg, definitely. Mm -hmm. uh, when he uh, Walter White, at a certain point, if you haven't seen the episode, he walks into a, a the lair of a drug local Albuquerque drug kingpin, and the guy says, "What's your name?" And he says, and he just does it as a lark because he's not right. going to give the guy's real name right. ever. Right. He says Heisenberg, and the idea is we never explain it, but the idea is that. It's a name that pops into his mind, and he is, I mean, we're, we're, we're shouting out to Werner Heisenberg and, hmm. uh, and his uncertainty principle or theorem or whatever. Yeah, it, it just says if the, the more detail that you have about something, the less you know about it. And so that's why I also thought the Heisenberg was, you know, because we thought we knew this guy and... You know, wow. So but I'm just making that deeper. up. I like that. <laughs> you I can like have your it. answer you can better have than mine. I like that. <laughs> you can that's, have I like the way he said that. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. So, so Walter's life is really bad, and uh, so I, I want to know it from the writing point of view, is this a cathartic act? Is this mischievous? Let, let me tell you what I did to Walt today. I mean, I'm, I'm wondering what your thinking is. I feel bad more for the other characters around him than for Walt, because Walt, hmm. Walt uh, makes these choices, and he does not have to. Hmm. Uh, maybe he did early on. Well, that's arguable, certainly. You don't have to. When you get a cancer diagnosis, the first thing that springs to mind is not necessarily, well, I'm going to cook crystal meth. But, I mean, we've given him even less reason to do it now than he mm -hmm. had originally. Right. So I'd feel bad for Jesse more often than not because Jesse kind of hangs on. He's like the dog that's always being kicked, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. This poor guy. But uh, we don't do it to be mischievous. We... we uh, I mean, you know, first and foremost, we're, we're trying to be entertaining. I mean, this show is definitely not a show for everybody. It's pretty dark. It's a pretty dark show, and it demands a lot of attention because it's so hyper-serialized. But, right. uh, but it is ultimately an entertainment, and it's, it's not, there's no political or social axe to grind. It's just a character study more mm -hmm. than anything. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's, uh, he's reaping what he has sown, and his family is reaping what he is sowing. And his, and his friends, his partner, and, um, you know, it, it's, it's a little biblical without the religion. It's like old school, Old Testament kind of, there's some Old Testament kind of judgments Definitely. that seem to be passed on him without the actual religion of it, but mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's just first and foremost meant to entertain and, and I suppose be cathartic in the sense of, you know, you watch, like when you watch a gangster movie, you watch uh, Scarface, you watch The Godfather, whatever, you intrigued by the characters, but also thinking, ooh, when they get their 
come up and you know it's kind of cathartic I suppose as a viewer because mm -hmm. it's like ooh I get to watch from the safety of my living room and right. and it's I'm not actually going through it myself but I can kind of live it without actually suffering it so mm -hmm. I suppose there's that mm -hmm. you know. great well, let me ask a couple of questions of just about you I mean uh, so what did you do growing up that made you perfectly suited for what you're doing now <laughs> <laughs> I don't what know. What didn't you do? <laughs> I didn't. Well, I didn't do much anything. I was pretty straight arrow. Hmm. I mean, I, I got the straight arrow part down. I mean, I because uh, I was too scared, you know, too nervous to steal or to whatever the expression is. I never broke bad that much because I was afraid of getting caught, not because hmm. I was in, intensely moral or anything. But, <laughs> but uh, I think it's intriguing the idea of breaking the law mm -hmm, and, and mm -hmm. being a bad guy. I don't find it so intriguing that I would. First of all, I don't think it's a good idea. Right. Intriguing doesn't mean <laughs> it's good. Yeah, yeah. Intriguing doesn't mean it's a good idea. It means mm -hmm. it, it, it holds your interest. It, it, it holds your attention. Mm -hmm. And I suppose there's that element. You're not going to live it, but it's interesting to learn about it by writing about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I wonder all the time. I read about guys in the newspaper, people in the newspaper, murderers and, and, and drug kingpins and just people who live lives so remote and so unexplainable to me. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about one act of violence born of, of you know, a uh, crime of passion or something, but somebody right. makes a lifestyle out of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's it's intriguing, and it's it's one way of sort of not really getting to the bottom of it, but examining it by mm -hmm. writing about it, yeah. I suppose. So, you know, creator, executive producer, Breaking Bad, what, what do you worry about? What? Um, everything. Okay. Just, uh, it was, it was what, it'd be easier to answer what I don't worry about. Mm -hmm. I could count it on one hand. Mm -hmm. I mean, just, you know, I'm very neurotic. I worry okay. about everything. <laughs> okay. I worry we're not going to have a fourth season. That's a big one I'm worried about now mm -hmm. because uh, our show has, has critically acclaimed, and I'm so very happy of this as it has been. Mm -hmm. uh, we have kind of priced ourselves up to a precipice where, mm -hmm. where our show, Below the Line, costs so much money to put on the air week in and week out that. Uh, Neither company that I work for is particularly happy about that right now. Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm, so they're mm -hmm. like, uh, you know, mm -hmm. how do we? Uh, and we're a couple hundred grand apart on what the show actually does cost and what they say they want to give us gotcha. as, as we speak. And hopefully that'll get resolved. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, over 13 episodes, it's not you know 2.6 million. It's not that big a deal. But yeah. nowadays, with the economy being in the toilet, I guess it is. So. Mm -hmm. I'm worried about ending the show right if I get the chance to end it. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. What's know. ending it right? And it, well, I just uh, you don't want to be you know you don't want to leave the party too late. Mm -hmm. It's better to leave the party too early than too yeah. late. You know right. you don't want to you, know, you you don't want people thinking oh man that show used to be good but now it just kind of <laughs> blows. A helpful thing in that regard would be to know when your show absolutely is going to end. But most TV shows don't get that. Mm -hmm. uh, Lost is a good example of a those guys. I only met the fellow who created that show one time, Damon Lindelof. Seems like a very good guy. They did it. He and his other producers did a very smart thing. Uh, three years ago, they said, we want this show to end at X date mm -hmm. three years from now. We think we got enough story to take it to that point, and we want to work to that and no further, no matter how big this thing is. And yeah. that, that takes a certain amount of moral courage mm -hmm. if, if you've got a hit because uh, you know otherwise you just want to pound it into the dust make every dime you can make that's right <laughs> but uh, most TV shows don't work that way I'd love I'd love for t TV shows to work that way more in mm -hmm. the future where you know how long you have when you're doing a serialized show and therefore you know what to write to right because we, we don't know that right now we're just making it up as we go along mm -hmm. right now so. mm -hmm. La last question for me any advice for young filmmakers uh, there's a lot of good advice. It, it is all, all of it screamingly obvious, but it's good nonetheless, just despite the fact that it's obvious. The one that springs to mind talking about Breaking Bad is that you are most likely going to fail with any given project that you come up with. Uh, we all do. I not only mean you, I mean all of us. Mm -hmm. when, when you uh, create a story, whether it's a movie or a TV show, and you pitch it out there to the world. You go around with meetings and, and whatnot, and more people are going to say no to you than yes, because people don't lose their jobs by saying no. Right. Even if it's saying no to American Idol or to <laughs> Avatar or whatever, you don't lose your job over saying no. Mm -hmm. 
unless you say it often enough to Avatar level movies. Right. But you do very quickly lose your job by saying yes to bombs. Mm -hmm. And so the culture in TV and in movies is one of fear and very conservative, a very conservative nature of let's not take a lot of risks because mm -hmm. we don't want to lose our jobs. Mm -hmm. So you're going to fail more often than not going out there. You might as well fail doing stuff you care about. <clears throat> it's harder to get emotionally kicked in the teeth over and over again, but it's more soul-sucking mm -hmm. to say, to read the trades and say, vampire movies are big now. I'm going to go out and pitch a, my version of a vampire movie mm -hmm. because I think that's what they want right now. You're going to, odds are, statistics tell you, you're going to, you're going to lose more often than you win. But that's why you kind of keep swinging because eventually statistics also tell you, you keep pulling that slot machine handle, you'll, you will eventually Hit. come up cherries. You know? mm -hmm. When you come up cherries, it might as well be for something you actually give a damn about, yeah. something that actually means something to you personally That's great. versus some crap you're trying to cynically throw out there because you think it's what everybody wants. So mm -hmm. that's, that's great my advice. best advice. Yeah. Maybe one or two questions from the audience. How about over here? Something that's been fascinating over the course of the three seasons is watching each character develop levels that you didn't realize, whether it's Anna Gunn's resilience or the depth to Aaron Paul's character. So which one really surprised you as, as the series was developing? That's a good question. They're, they're, I, I, they're, they're all, I am so proud of this cast. It's, it's, I mean, I'm biased, but they're the best, they're, they're best cast in TV, in, in my mm -hmm. opinion. I, I love every one of them. The actors are so good. And I love all of them, and they're such a pleasure to work with. There's no pain in the butt amongst them. They're yeah. all good people, and they love working on the show. Uh, I guess if I had to narrow it down to one, because they all surprise me. I guess my point of saying all is that they all surprise me in little ways, uh, just about week in and week out. But the one, I guess if I had to say one, it'd probably be the character of Hank, played by Dean Norris, the brother-in-law, yeah. uh, the DEA agent, because <clears throat> his initial structural reason for existing when I wrote the pilot was to be kind of an irritant to Walt. He was the, the guy who was sort of one of life's winners, who's, you know, got the gun, he's talking at the birthday party in the pilot, and he's, you know, I had a big drug bust the other week, and, mm -hmm. and Walt's own son in the pilot seems to respect and be wowed more by his fire-pissing Uncle Hank than by his own dad. Mm -hmm. So structurally, dramatically speaking, Hank's original reason for existing was to help give Walt the reason he has for coming up with the idea of cooking crystal meth. This sort of this perverse idea of I'm kind of on some level going to be sticking to my brother-in-law who I kind of have this love-hate but mostly Jeez. irritation and resentment right. feeling toward. And we cast this guy Dean Norris who came in and, and read all the frat boy hail fellow well met stuff perfectly. But what I got to know about Dean is that he's, there's a lot more to him than that. He can be funny and he can be shallow and he can also go way deep. And, you know, I didn't really think that much about the character to begin with, but he is such an interesting guy in real life that uh, it's just one of those things that happens when you, when you have a TV show. Uh, certain people's strengths rise to the occasion and they come into your... Um, perception and you and you write more and more for them and you do things with their characters that you wouldn't have thought you would ever do. So he's, you know, he's, it's almost, you know, with most TV shows with cops in it, eventually the cop's going to go bad. You know, we're, we're expecting there to be a bad guy cop at some point. The, the fact that he is a DEA agent who is actually a good guy and actually abides by the law is almost it's, it's almost perverse in terms of television <laughs> because it's just so what you don't expect right. because it's so obvious in some sense. But so much of that is, is due to Dean being the guy he is, and he's just fun to write for, and he's, run, he's fun to write problems for. Because this was a guy, in long story short, this is a guy who, who when I first conceived him, didn't, ha didn't have any problems. And mm -hmm. suddenly he's a character who has some of the most intense problems on the show. If you watch the show, suddenly he's, he's suffering from... Uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, and he's mm -hmm. got a lot of problems. He's got a lot of issues, and he's trying very hard to keep everything squashed down and hide it from the world, and that, of course, leads to more drama. And so he's been the most surprising, I guess, is the answer. So. Mm -hmm. One more question here. Um, I was wondering how you take uh, Walt 
and make him somebody that I want to spend time with watching. Not just watch him go into you know, this dark world, but gleefully go with him. Because he, he's literally melted a man in a bathtub. Yeah. And I'm like, yes, go ahead and do that. That's amazing. Well, that, that was so cool. I know, but that's, I mean, it's, it's, it's a weird thing to get me to cheer for somebody who's doing something so bad. It's another very good question. I mean, I know structurally certain things we do as writers to get you on his side. And I, and I also know, and it's nothing we do, but I also know that you either sign on to a show or you don't. And there's plenty of people out there who watched a, a 10 minutes or an hour of Breaking Bad and said, eh, it's not for me. But once you sign on, I think it's a psychological thing that we all possess that you, uh, the protagonist is the protagonist, even if he's a bad guy. And I, I learned this personally from watching The Sopranos. You know, Tony mm -hmm. Soprano is an awful guy in so many ways, and yet I couldn't wait to watch what he's going to do next. Right. But I think the most important part of the, the most, the best answer to your question is is what Brian Cranston brings to it as an actor. This is a guy. Forget whether he's doing bad or good. This is a guy. I and I'm just speaking for myself. I always find very watchable. We had an episode last Sunday night where he is sitting in a hospital waiting room. Uh, waiting to see whether his brother-in-law is going to die or not. And he's sitting at a table much like this, and he pulls a magazine off the table, and the table is wobbly. And we just hold on this one wide shot for probably close to a minute, probably longer than a minute. And he pulls out the, uh, the one, of, one of these mail-away coupons from the magazine. He folds it up, and he puts it under the thing, and it still wobbles. And then he <laughs> folds it again, and he puts it under. I don't know how he does what he does, but we have confidence writing for him, my writers and I, that he can pull a scene like that off and stay. I don't know, I watched that scene, maybe I'm too close to it, maybe other people are like, well, what the hell is this, but <laughs> I'm watching this thing and I'm just like, I've seen it in the editing room a hundred times and something is so watchable about this guy. I don't mm. know how he does it, mm. I don't know what he's doing, but it's not, it's not, certainly not just in the writing, it's the guy we have playing this part. Yeah. Could you talk actually about some of the, the sort of structural, technicalized <laughs> things that you do to sort of get uh, people on the protagonist side? You mentioned that some of that was sort of intention and how you wrote it. How do you do that? Uh, well, uh, off the top of my head, having your, your, your protagonist uh, surround him with some worse guys than he is. I mean, uh, uh, that's, that's an oldie but a, but a goodie. I mean, uh, Walt, as bad a decision maker as he is and has, as, as cold and as thoughtless as he can be toward other people and, and hurts, hurtful to his own family. You put him in a room with uh, a guy like we had a character named Tuco who was just Tuco. insane, <laughs> just that's snorting meth off the end of a, a Bowie knife and just <laughs> shooting at cows with an M16 and just, Mad man. It's just, as, just as batshit crazy and violent as, as we could possibly conceive of. And you you know, you put him in a room with Charles Manson, and Charles Manson's going to start looking okay at a certain <laughs> point. So that's one thing. Uh, we surround him by, by with uh, with uh, people like that, oftentimes. Uh, another way to do it is um, he's not. He has moments of arrogance, but he definitely has moments of arrogance. But by and large, he's in over his head, and he knows it, uh, and that keeps him human and I think sympathizable. When you're watching someone and they're not at the top of their game and they're, and they're just trying to make it through the day, we can all sympathize with that. Mm -hmm. And so often that's the case with Walt. I mean, he does love his, his infant daughter and we see that. He does love his son and we see that. He's not a good dad in the sense that he shouldn't be doing what he's doing, but he is a good dad in the sense that he truly loves his family. He's just got this huge blind spot for this bad behavior he's up to. But mm -hmm. uh, those, are, those are all ways, I suppose. And he has passion. I think characters that have passion are interesting. I mean, it doesn't matter what passion, what the passion is for. Walt's passion is for chemistry, and there's nothing goofy about chemistry, but it's his love for science, his passion for chemistry, I think, is engaging and, and infectious. People with passion... I find infectious. Absolutely. So Absolutely. there's that too, I guess. There's one more question over here. Uh, the opening moments of almost epi each episode of Breaking Bad contains like a riddle or an image 
or like a haunting or intriguing moment. And I was curious, is that something that just kind of emerged organically through the process, or is that something you guys kind of intended to do all along? I, I, I'm glad you like those. I, uh, I have to give credit to Chris Carter, my boss on the X-Files. For mm -hmm. I was on that show for seven years, and that's the teaser you're speaking of. Yeah. And, and we do the exact same structure uh, that uh, that I learned on, on the X-Files. I mean, it's a way of grabbing the audience, pure and simple, sure. but it's they're fun to come up with. They're a lot of fun to come up with, and we labor over them because we take them very seriously. We want to we want to grab the audience either with a, some visual image or some idea, or hopefully if we're hitting on all cylinders, a little bit of everything, a visual image, an idea, a promise for the future, a promise of a mystery to be revealed. Again, Chris Carter was such a good boss for me because his whole thing with the X-Files was <clears throat> there's got to be some visual component to the, to the mystery hmm. of, of the week's episode. There's got to be... Ideas are great and are to be lauded, and we got to get the good ideas in there. We got to get the good drama in there. We got to get the, but we need some visual element because it's this is a visual medium, you know, television, just like movies. Same difference. Just one has commercials and one doesn't, but it's all the same visual storytelling. And so I try very hard to to pay uh, heed to that, is what he always told us, and and, and I just I just stole it from him. So yeah, great. Thank you. Another question? Going off of that, at what point did you say, hey guys, let's crash two planes together? <laughs> and, um, and did you know that that's how, what you wanted to do when you created the image of the teddy bear eyeball? Because yeah. of course we all thought it was something to do with right. Skylar's baby. Yeah. yeah. It was, uh, we, that's why we only did it in season two. In season two, if you watch the show, there's an image at the beginning of the season of a, of a plastic eyeball floating on the pool, the mm -hmm. backyard pool of uh at Walt's house, and then there's a pink teddy bear submerged beneath the water, mm -hmm. and you keep we keep cutting to that all season long, and uh, adding a little bit every time we see it, a little more visual, um, a little more visual clues as to what it means. Although it is a mis it is purposefully obviously a misdirect, the entire season long. Man, it was a bear to come up with that, mm -hmm. as in a bear to come up with. We when you when you do a bookend season, you have the image. At the, mm. at the very first image of the season is also the very last image of the season. Mm. You have to know where you're going. And mm -hmm. I think we sat in a room for three and a half, four weeks without getting anything done mm. as we figured out. I mean, we were getting a lot done, but we didn't have a lot to show for our work. But we were like, I want to do a bookend season, but I don't know what that means exactly. And you just sort of blindly feel your way through it. Okay, there's a teddy, what's it like a freaky image, a teddy bear in a pool? You know, mm -hmm. like a burned, scalded-looking teddy right. bear. Yeah. And, uh, well, you know, we want people to think there was a meth lab, probably. We want people to think the house blew up or that there was some terrible act of violence here. And, but then ultimately, when it turns out it's the result of this plane crash, and yet the plane crash itself was inadvertently the result of, of a very bad decision Walt made, right. then, you know, hopefully it all meshes. And, but that was that was a bear to come up with that one. That's why we did. That's now. That's why we're not doing it this season. And also because mm -hmm. you do it once, people expect it. So try to do something else people aren't expecting. So, yeah. question over here. You've referenced Sopranos, uh, X Files, and and a number of other shows. Could you speak to any kind of uh, filmmakers and, and oh, styles yeah. that you've borrowed upon? I, I have no one favorite, but yeah, I could talk all day about influences as far as. Uh, we spoke earlier of uh, The Godfather, Godfather Part Two. Um, our show, I very much want it to feel like a Western, right. uh, a Western without horses and, and guns and holsters, you know, but otherwise I want the show to feel like a Western, and uh, therefore a lot of uh, Sergio Leone. We, as a matter of fact, uh, this last season, every new director who would come, we would sit them down in a room and have them watch the first 15 minutes of Once Upon a Time in the West. Hmm. which is just stunning. If you haven't seen it for a while or if you've never seen it, do yourself a favor and rent the DVD. It's the first 15 minutes, to remind you, uh, is uh, it's three guys waiting for a train in the middle of nowhere. And once the train comes and Charles Bronson's going to get off the train, there's going to be all kinds of hell's going to break loose. And there's very little dialogue, and it's just images. And it's super vast wide shots interspersed with very close-up shots and little details like uh, Woody Strode standing underneath a water tower, water's dripping on his hat, hmm. and he drinks water out of his hat. The top of it. Just wonderful 
You don't even know what it means. It's sort of like the teaser idea you were asking about. Just beautiful stuff. Uh, and we want the show to be as visual and cinematic as possible. So a lot of Sergio Leone, a lot of Kurosawa. Kurosawa also framed for those wonderful tableaus he would do. The Seven Samurai, Yojimbo, all the Hidden Fortress, all these great movies. He'd, he'd go, he'd sit back and, and, and let things happen wide. And, and it's so utterly different from this frenetic. What's wrong is doing it all the same way as everyone else is doing it. Hmm. So it's like zig when everybody else is zagging. We're not reinventing anything with Breaking Bad, but what we are doing is a different kind of composition from what currently is prevalent or predominates on television. We, we, we're not reinventing in any way, shape, or form composition. We're going back to the masters. But it seems to me so obvious. Televisions are so, so damn big now. You can watch uh, John Ford Western. You can watch uh, Sergio Leone Western. You can watch all this stuff you know, with the black bars and whatnot, it looks fantastic because yeah. it's like this big. Mm -hmm. And yet, uh, I don't know why <laughs> it's not catching on more. It will eventually. Yeah. And then, and then of so. course, we'll have to think of something else new to do because you don't want to look like everybody else. But right. it's pretty easy to look different now because so much of it's this now. Mm -hmm. Hey, let's thank our speaker. We have a, gif a gift for you. Oh, wow. Maybe you can open it in front of oh, us. Oh, yeah. Wow. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Hmm. Thank you for raising the profile of science in your exciting program, Breaking Bad. Very nice. You're very welcome. Like my mom always said, you want to try to save the wrapping. Yeah, I'm from that generation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I want to save the wrapping and reuse it. Oh, this is cool. I've heard of this. Oh, this is a great, this guy's great. And, you know, he, sure writes, he writes for Periodic Popular table. Science. Yeah, he does. He writes, he does. This guy does, this is a great book. And I do not have, now I have it. Thank you. <laughs> this is awesome. This guy writes a great column every month. And his name's Theodore Gray. Every month he writes in uh, Popular Science. And he, he'll, you know, tell you how to make an arc light out of a pencil and a, you know, whatever. That's right. How to do crystal meth. How to, yeah. <laughs> this is a thank you very much. Oh, our pleasure. Our pleasure. Let, let's thank him again.